Call the meeting to order. Oh. Council and Councillor Cohen, Cohen isn't here, but I expect her to be here any moment. Um, just a word on meeting logistics. If you're joining remotely, please change your name on your display uh, so that it shows your first and last name. And I will try to uh, be more diligent about <clears throat> asking everyone to state their name when they step up to address the council because I heard some, uh, I wasn't on top of that fully last time and I think everyone's entitled to know who's speaking. Um, anyone who's going to address the council, either for general business or appearance and appearances or otherwise, we would, uh, you're not entitled to speak until you're recognized by the chair. And then uh, we ask your comments to be limited to two minutes and Councillor uh, Bate will, uh, <clears throat> will be assisting us with timekeeping. Um, first item on the agenda is to approve uh, the agenda. We have uh, one change, right? And that is uh, item 10, Arts Commission presentation will not uh, be taking place taking place tonight. We'll reschedule that uh, for a subsequent meeting. Any other? Uh, we'll do that when we get to the consent agenda. Anyone aware of any other changes to the agenda? If not, we can proceed to general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on any topic that is not on tonight's agenda. And again, I, please identify yourself and keep your comments to two minutes. Yes, sir. A microphone on these things, I stink. Anyways, good evening. I'm Maurice Martineau, 6 Scribner Street. Uh, I'm just called, stopping in again to ask in terms of hunting on the land up at the old Elks property as turkey hunting starts May 1st and uh, deer hunting obviously in the fall. However, what I wanted to make um, people aware of, I mean, just in Sabin's pasture, I counted 23 deer. Um, they're gonna wreak havoc on <laughs> flowers, everything, anything that grows as it does. So I just wanted to put my two bits worth into, again, being allowed to hunt on the property up there. Okay, thank you. Have you uh, been participated at participating in the planning process and responding to the surveys? I've not received anything in my email anyways. Okay. Uh, I haven't been asked to participate. It was mentioned to me before. I said I was available, but no one's contacted me. It's, it's all on the city's webpage. And so... <clears throat> If you want to hear it on the planning process for Country Club Road property, that's where you go. Thank you. Stephen. Steve Whitaker, Montpelier. Um, it all being on the city's website is is a lame excuse. Uh, that's not outreach. I want to point out that, that there's not a complete backet for the last three meetings. Uh, some We can't manage to print uh, a legible copy of the agenda materials. They're chopped off where they're, you can't make, you can't read the complete sentences. And I've showed them to the assistant city manager on the last several occasions, presuming it would get corrected, but still again tonight, you can't read the chopped off portions of the packet. So you don't have a complete packet available for the public. The dust, I, I got a little excited to, week or two ago, week ago, I saw people actually with brooms sweeping the sidewalks. And lo and behold, they sweep it right into the tight corners of the where the street sweeper can't reach. So the depth of the inches in some places, the depth of the sand that's blowing through the streets, causing a whole lot of people respiratory distress is it's I can't I can't make excuses for those folks, you know, it's you know, we we can we can get away with knocking down light post after light post, but it, sweeping the streets to where the street sweeper won't pick it up. But it's just really the level of uh, services that we're paying for 
and that y'all are not policing to make sure we're getting our money's worth is is really absurd. Um, I'm not going to stick around for lack of confidence in your process for the homelessness stuff, but I was made aware that they were told in no uncertain terms there wasn't going to be a shelter in Montpelier, and they left that out of the report. So the the thumb or the sandbag on the scale, the corruptness of this city just defies uh, defies. Uh, oh, one more thing. I see. I saw a meeting warning. You need to direct your staff or your appointees that even after Donna Bates' term lapsed the day before town meeting, she's still pretending to call a meeting for CVPSA for tomorrow night to try to wrap up, you know, to to complete the the death spell list now that she tried to enforce while it's in litigation. You cannot close the CVPSA while the liabilities are still open. It's still in litigation. You need to direct Justin as your other delegate uh, to not attend, not pretend to attend a farce, false meeting, not legally called by an ex chair. She's term limited. She can't be back on. I just don't know why y'all don't pay attention to this stuff. <clears throat> Thank you. Anybody else in the room who, uh, is seeking to be recognized. <clears throat> and is there anyone online who is seeking to be recognized? I am not seeing any hands up. Okay, we'll move to the next item on the agenda, which is the consent agenda. Sorry? <clears throat> Now there's a request to remove certain items from the consent agenda. Okay. I'd ask to remove the items for the uh, Perry Street intersection for conversation on the regular agenda. And also um, just the Grout Road Bridge, just to take that off the consent agenda. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Great. Um, would chair would I entertain a motion with regard to the rest of the consent agenda? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 And all those opposed? The consent agenda is passed with the exception of items D and G, I crossed over D and G. Okay. Yeah. I. Oh, yeah. yep, you're right. You see, I crossed it out. So <laughs> can't read it. Okay. So, Kelly, do you have something you can tell us about either of these? But we get um, the DPW uh, public works director here to uh, comment on these items and give you a briefing. Great. Oh, can you hear me now? Is that better? Okay. Uh, Kurt Monica, uh, DPW director, is going to brief you on these items. Hi, Kurt. Um, so, yeah, start with uh, the very main intersection. Mm -hmm. um, so, was, there was a study done several years ago uh, on the intersection. Mm -hmm. uh, people probably know that there are times where it's difficult to turn out of Barry Street onto Main Street. Um, so out of that scoping study, you know, options were evaluated around about um, or a signalized intersection, and it was uh, the signalized intersection that was selected. Um, the city bonded $500,000 for the improvements, which includes the engineering work. Um, the item for approval tonight is the engineering, the full de design of the intersection, which includes um, uh, coordination with the other two traffic lights adjacent the one at um, memorial and main and at state and main and it also includes a preemptive um, uh, ability for the rail crossing that's in that intersection so if the rail is coming through you know those lights would go red to keep people from getting um, on the tracks um, so i'm not sure if you had specific questions uh, but this is specifically for um, getting that design work done. We're planning on going to construction next summer. 
Yeah, I think because I wasn't along for the earlier conversations, I you answered one, which is what's the total budget for the project. So this $94,000 approval is the first step. That's right. Um, the rule of thumb historically has been $250,000 roughly for uh, intersection um, construction. This one's a little more complicated because of the rail and everything. Um, and costs have gone up um, a bit in the last couple of years uh, due to inflation and uh, material pricing. Um, but we're fairly you know, comfortable that we'll be within budget for this. And then the only thought is just in terms of our priorities, in terms of public works, is is this really the next project? It's, it's one of one good. of many. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> we have a lot of projects that are ongoing for this summer and next year. Okay. Um, but yeah, it was identified as a high priority due to due to traffic issues there. All right. Thanks. And we spent a lot of time in <clears throat> in public meetings uh, to look at the different possibilities for how to create how to make that inter intersection work and is, is it the only failed intersection in the city? Is it a failed intersection by yeah. state standards? <laughs> you want to speak to that? <laughs> uh, you know, I don't know um, that it's classified as failed, but as a low level of service. So it's not functioning um, great. And Donna? Well, at the time, Ashley Hill was on the city council when we first started talking mm -hmm. about this. And she commuted regularly through Berry Street and complained about how long she waited. Pedestrians especially have complained about it. And we did a lot of public outreach. And one of the town meetings, we had a map out there with the consultants and had kids as well as adults pinpoint what were the biggest issues for walking. And wow, Barry Street driving, drivers don't feel safe with pedestrians, pedestrians don't feel safe with uh, cars. And then we have bicycles in there. Mm -hmm. And so that's the other part is that shared path connecting with both sides of Main Street. I was all for a roundabout and got... Uh, <laughs> I lost. I lost the argument because one, the railroad didn't allow it, but also the expense because you really need roundabouts on both sides of it. And so I would like you to expand though on the light because it's more than just time. It's a, a very sensitive light system we're putting in. Yes. Right. That's, so that's the part where the coordination comes in. Yeah. Um, uh, sometimes called adaptive technology where um, basically it expedites traffic flow by um, sort of recognizing um, the traffic coming from the nearby intersection and changing its timing in order to, um, you know, facilitate improved traffic flow. But like Donna said, yeah, there is a, it is also a pedestrian concern. So there will be a, a push button, you know, pedestrian crossing there, much like the main and state intersection as well. And uh, Grout Road now. Yep. So um, Grout Road is a... Um, a uh, road out towards the end of Elm Street um, services a small number of houses, but uh, we've been working on this project for um, several years. One of the homes there has a failed well, um, and they're unable to um, drill a new well because the bridge isn't structurally sound enough to get uh, a drill rig across it. Uh, we have a, um, a structures grant from the state of Vermont for $175,000. Uh, that um, We've had that for two years. As we work through design on this project, it expires um, at the end of this calendar year. Um, so we, if we don't move forward, you know, we jeopardize losing that grant money. Um, the project did come in over over the um, engineer's estimate. We hired a consultant to do the design and the estimate for us. Um, the um, the balance, uh, the gap is about 120000 And uh, we're going to we plan to pay for that and you know, working with the finance department. Um, we were able to determine that the money for the appraisal was booked both in the general fund and in the capital plan. Um, and that's $129,000. So the plan is to utilize uh, that funding in, um, in the capital fund, that budget budgeted amount in the capital fund to close the gap. Um, so I think it was mostly a, a financial question we had two bids they were both very close within like um, thirty thousand dollars so we don't feel like the, the contractors bids are out of scale um, because they were so close to each other so um it's just the you know the the cost of um, construction has, has really drastically gone up and in a very short time faster than we've seen um that i've ever seen really so is there is there any other further well, questions you, on that? you answered it thank you i, I have a um I wasn't um, participating at all in 
uh, when this first came up. It's been around for a while. I, I don't want to take up a lot of time on it, but because it was at the top of the agenda and because I'm sort of new at this, I spent a little more time looking at it than I probably should have. And I just had some questions about it because even though the bids are close, they're unusual. The lowest bid is $120,000 over the other bid on four items. And so it just makes me wonder, and some of them are commodities like steel and concrete, really. So I understand there's pricing differences. I and mean, I, I participated in bids, not, not on commercial work, but I understand that there's differences. And I, I read the bid analysis, and I understand that people try to balance their bid. They front load. They do a lot of, a lot of things to adjust. But it's such a large difference, and the, the market is so volatile. I wonder if there's a, um, a contractual solution like a, a cost plus with a guaranteed maximum instead of a fixed price. I mean, there are, we know there are contingencies in there. And if they don't arise, we might say if, well, the winning bidder was was $120,000 100, high on three items. So he had to make that up. And then the additional 20,000 that he's under the other guy. So I understand where that might come from, but a different structure in the contract might um, keep the contractor happy and save us money. Is it possible to do? Have we ever done anything like that? It's not an uncommon contract in commercial commercial work. Yeah, I've only done one um, guaranteed maximum price contract. That was for the wastewater plant, um, the phase one project that we just completed. Uh, it's a little bit, it's really too kind of too late to do it on this project. We mm -hmm. did sit down with the contractor and looked at items that we could remove. So this was bid as like a, a what we call a unit unit price contract. Yeah, I saw, I saw that, yeah. Yeah, so every, and it's uh, the VTrans model. So the state of Vermont um, you know, kind of has this model of the spec book and that's what the engineer followed. So they outlined those specific bid items based mm -hmm. on state specifications. Um, so we did go through, when we met with a contractor, we opened bids. Um, when we looked at items that could be removed from the contract and they did offer up, you know, I think it was 30 plus thousand dollars of savings to the city that of items that we could remove. But as far as renegotiating a guaranteed contract, um, you know, I, I don't think you can, you know, one, we don't really have the time, the contractor, um, and they have a lot of other, there's a lot of other work out there. Yeah. Um, so we don't really have time to rebid it, but, um, that would really change the entire contract with, um, with the contractor. So I think you'd have to do that it initially. It would change the terms of the, of the bid. Yeah, certainly. it yeah. really would. Um, so it's kind of a drastic change. I don't, I don't think we could do that at this point, but you know, it, it is a good model for certain types of contracts. Yeah. Uh, just one other question. The, the temporary bridge was a, was a big difference in price. I think it was, um, I'm not sure exactly. Uh, Fifty fifty six thousand dollars difference in a in a temporary bridge. Is there a is there an explanation for that that makes sense? <laughs> yeah. Well, if you look at the engineer's estimate compared to the bid prices from both contractors, that oh was, yeah, that no, was the biggest was, difference for yeah, sure. Yeah, he, he bid fifty and they bid two thirty six yeah. and one one ninety something or one eighty right. something. Right. So the engineer estimated fifty thousand and the bids came in closer to two hundred thousand. Yeah. So that was by far the biggest. Uh, difference yeah you know that is the bulk of the gap between what we have for funding allocated um and the bid prices that came in so we we did think about um taking that item out but um you know it adds a lot of challenges to construction and that they were planning to use the temporary bridge to move equipment back and forth um they would have you know basically lock up an excavator on one side of the bridge and not sure. be able to use it um and in addition to that uh, the homes would be out of their houses no access for um, 90 days, which really seemed excessive, um, you know, for yeah. the three houses. So we tried to make that work, but it just didn't seem like a viable option. I think the engineer just really underestimated the item. That's what it comes down to. Yeah, no, it sounds like uh, things have changed in the temporary bridge business. Um, good. I, you know, I, I, I didn't expect that you'd be able to make many of these changes, but um, if if prices continue to be this volatile on projects, we might we might consider an alternative or at least offering that as an option. Yeah. Um, thanks. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Is there a motion to approve those two items? So moved. Second. All right. Any further discussion? 
All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? And items B and I from the consent agenda are approved outside the consent agenda. Okay, next up we have, oh, yes. I have a procedural. Um, the, the projector, the screen is showing just individual names. Can we have the audience see the same grouping that we see? Is that possible? Uh, I think we'll see. We'll try to work on that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. There must be a way to do that. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Okay, we have uh, we have a set of appointments. Items six, seven, and eight are appointments on uh, to the Art Commission, the MIAC Energy Advisory Committee, and the Tree Board. And I see a number of people in the room for for those. So I suggest we recognize anyone who's here for any of these uh, items. Have them address the council, and we then we go from there. So. Let's see. <laughs> Good evening. I'm John Still, uh, expired board member. <laughs> Never. I'm not sure how it happened, but I would love to continue to be on the tree board. I've been on it since the beginning and uh, still have a few more years in me before I actually expire. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, I, I am the chair of the tree board, and somehow it escaped me that every last one of us was an <laughs> expired term. So, We'll work on that one next time. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Good evening. My name is John Akulashik. I'm also an expired member of the tree board, and I'm looking for a reappointment uh, because I enjoy doing the work. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Okay. And I don't know. Uh, is there anyone here in the room from any of the for any of the other boards, or anyone online? wanting to uh, speak who's applied for any of the other boards. Sure, hi, this is Julia Leopold um, and I'm applying for appointment for uh, the Montpelier Energy Advisory Committee. Great, thank you. Thanks. And it looks like nobody else is here. So council, what's your pleasure? We. This is a matter that can be taken up in executive session, but it's not mandatory. That the court, we would entertain a motion. Yeah, just if I'm reading it right, every one of these have room for all of these people to be appointed. So there's no space issues that yep. we're wrestling with. Um, I would move can I just move the slate or should I read everyone? Sure. I would move the slate of appointees um, to the Public Arts Commission, the Energy Advisory Committee, and the Tree Board. Second. So is there any, and is that enough for you, John, for the minutes? Thank you. Any discussion? All those in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Yes, Don. I, I just want the new members of the council to know that John and John have been our heroes as far as our elm trees. Got us out in front of it and have handled it. It's just been marvelous. Thank Ash. you, gentlemen. Ash, Ash tree. Yep. <laughs> well, I got your attention. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next item on the agenda is, uh, is fireworks. We have a uh, presentation from a member of the community and then we can have a discussion about what, if anything, the council wants to uh, do about it. Is that you? Hi. My name is Karen Henry from Montpelier. I did submit packets to everybody. I hope you had the chance to review them because I uh, met you guys before and sort of gave you a summation. So I was just hoping you had a chance to review the environmental impact, the impact on human life, animal life. And if there's anything you want to ask me, or I'm not really sure how these proceedings go, once I've submitted um, the information that I wanted you to have. So I'll, you just tell me what to do or just sit down and listen, or I don't know how this works. Thank you. Well, if there's anything you want us to hear, this is would be the time to do oh, it. I think the packets are pretty comprehensive. Um, 
I didn't I didn't um, include all the stories of the emails I had gotten from people in the community who had animals killed because they had tried to escape, you know, from the noise. Um, several emails from veterans with PTSD who suffered through those evenings and thought they were the only ones. Um, a lot of a lot of responses from the community really um, saying it's time to look at this and revisit this practice. Uh, if, if I could, yeah. Um, is it the, is it the Fourth of July celebration specifically that you're it's talking? It's fireworks. About? Fireworks. The fireworks. Yeah. yeah, not the celebration. Of course yeah. not. I mean, we all want to celebrate, um, but it's the fireworks specifically that are problematic. I mean, fireworks, unpermitted fireworks, are illegal, I think, in Vermont and in the city. I don't really know. Yeah. Yeah. I'm talking about the shows that Montpelier funds. The permitted, and, the permitted yes, yes. fireworks. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, do the the conditions that you described in the materials you submitted do they also occur in the? Um, I mean, there's a certainly in my neighborhood. There's a lot of illegal fire, fireworks happening. Is it the, is it the same? I think the impact Problem, is probably is it... different. If you look at if you look at the displays like from National Life, that's pretty significant versus someone that sets off a mat of firecrackers on Loomis Street. You know what I mean? The impact is different. I mean, but it's it's the big shows with the smoke and the chemicals in the smoke, the heavy metals in the smoke, um, the overbearing um explosive sounds. You know, fireworks are kind of annoying, but they're not as overwhelming as a as a show that overshadows the entire town. I think the impact is not lovely with the amount of fireworks, but it's not the same as as the massive shows that we have used twice a year. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Is there uh, is, is there a motion to take action? We could, if we wanted to, uh, initiate a ordinance adoption process, uh, but that of course for its public hearings and all that so it's a matter of is there a, a motion to do that um, there there is such a thing as a quiet firework it's not actually silent but it's been adopted by other municipalities in the u.s and actually around the world um i wonder if uh we might try that. It, I mean, it changes the, the profile, the sound, certainly. Um, I'm not sure what it does for the other issues, but it might be worth a try. We, we might try laser light show, too, instead of like fireworks. Uh, it might be another option. I don't know the budget. Do, do you have the budget for that? Well, we're having discussion with the, yeah. with the council so, level right now. You know, I, yeah. I'll just point out that the fireworks are not something the city does. The fireworks are something that uh, Montpelier Alive does for the uh, Independence Day um, uh, celebration. And so these are certainly discussions that could go to uh, Montpelier Alive. So I'm on their board. So if you want me to bring this discussion back, well, I I could. Or if there's another way of doing this, you can always, the city council can advise me. But I am on their board, so. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. The contacts, people that have contacted me the last day or two since this has come up, um, all nicely indicated that they like the fireworks. Um, it's a couple times a year and not every year. Uh, there were no New Year's fireworks this year. Um, I think National Life does it for their Do Good Fest on occasion, and the Mountaineers do some ball games. And that's my understanding of the scale of what happens in Montpelier. So I like them. Um, I'm inclined to leave it as it is. Yeah, having two teenage um, kids who are very, very uh, concerned about environment and other living beings. Um, you know, I prefer 
not having them. But of course, it's as you said, it's a maybe it's a public um, discussion matter. Okay. Can we simply recommend to the to the folks who's who's I mean, if it's not a city function, um, what are what are our what are we able to do? Are we able to recommend to the folks who do sponsor and plan the displays that they consider an alternative? You could make a motion if you wanted to, and this and see if. Uh, See if there's support for it, or any member can say can contact them directly and say, "Have you thought of this? Have you thought of that?" Yes, Lord. Well, I, I do wonder if a next step could be um, having Pellin talk with Montpelier Alive and just see, like, bring these issues to their attention, see if there's interest in alternatives. If, I mean, if we could avoid a whole ordinance process, knowing that, as Tim said, it's really not very many people who are <laughs> like putting on big firework displays. So if we could have some conversations, we might be able to see, are there, there's the quieter ones, like, are there environmentally more friendly ones? Are there alternatives altogether? Um, so I think maybe that option would be my preference is have some conversations first. Does that require a motion? Um, Carrie, what were you going to say? Uh, I'm sorry. Pal Mr. Mayor, uh, can uh, Montpelier a live board invite? Uh, can we invite uh, her to our uh, sure. meetings? Sure. Okay. She's asking okay. if the Montpelier live board could invite you to one of their meetings. And the answer is yeah. yes. Yeah. So, yeah. Again, I don't know what will happen, but I just want to bring you and them together. Then it will be a better discussion. Only me, like trying to explain what I understood from your document. It would be better if you were there and just, you know, explain everything. Um, it will be better communication. Yeah, whatever the Montpelier Life Board yeah. wants to do, yeah, exactly. totally fine. Yeah. Carrie. Yeah, I, I've also heard just from a couple of people directly about this who expressed. Um, that they would like to keep the fireworks, that they enjoy the fireworks. And so I just want to, uh, it doesn't sound like we're talking about taking a vote, but I want to be clear that the city council is not directing Montpelier Alive to do anything in particular, um, but that we're, you know, the idea has come up that perhaps you could speak with Montpelier Alive, who does many of the fireworks shows and talk to them about alternatives. There will be other fireworks shows that happen in town. Um, so that wouldn't cover everything, but that could be a good place to start. Yeah. Oh, good. I think there are different people. Huh? Yeah. Different, different executive director. Um, all right. Not hearing a motion. So I think we move to the next item on the agenda, which is the follow up on the homelessness report. Kelly, we're turning, turning this over to you. Who wants to speak? People have hands raised. I'm sorry, I didn't see that. Um, we can. People have hands raised that want to speak about the issue. Okay, I wasn't seeing your hand. Sorry, uh, Peter Kelman. Uh, yes, Peter Kelman. I live on Mountain View Street, very close to National Life. Um, I thoroughly support Karen Hanrahan's asking uh, for the city. In, and the various organizations that are doing this to consider alternatives. I don't think a few people saying that they like fireworks, even if one of them is Tim Heaney, um, constitutes a, a reason for keeping them. Uh, Karen has pr provided a very persuasive case. And uh, even leaving aside the pets for the moment, we have veterans who have PTSD who are severely and adversely affected by this. I think that consideration should trump, excuse the expression, um, uh, 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 that some our kids like fireworks. Also, the people who like fireworks ought to have a chance to see some alternatives. Laser shows and low impact uh, 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 shows, they've never seen them. So ask, saying, I like fireworks, saying, well, yeah, I like milk in the morning, or I like to have my coffee in the morning. What are the alternatives? I think we should take, we should really provide some alternatives and then see, then ask people, 
hey, what did you think about that compared to the fireworks? Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm kind of disturbed by the tenor of this conversation. Um, I think that if you don't want to make a decision as as a uh, uh, about an ordinance, because I agree ordinances are a pain in the neck, I think there ought to be a very clear discussion with all your organizations, with the Mountaineers, with National Life, with uh, uh, with um, um, Montpelier Alive, and maybe even form a little you know working committee to look at alternatives. And I think the city council should say we want to look at alternatives. We want to see whether that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Katie Trouts. Hi, yeah, thanks. Um, so I think Katie, that it's a strong- Katie. Oh, would hello? You, would you identify yourself? Oh, I'm Katie Trouts with Montpelier Alive, the executive director, new executive director. Um, I appreciate uh, people bringing up the concerns about fireworks. I, on one hand, completely agree. I do just want to mention that we have looked into alternatives. Um, fire, And I don't think people understand, fireworks cost $12,500 for one single event, um, which we have managed to afford as Montpelier Live. Um, and... Uh, a we looked into a drone laser uh, light show as an alternative, and it cost over forty five thousand dollars for a single light show. It's not something that you can like keep the drones and do it again and again. And so we are looking into alternatives. They seem really unaffordable. There might be ways that we can work on finding funding, but I just want everyone to be aware of that we're looking into it. And it seems like um, at least for the next year, uh, kind of impossible. We also have to plan our fireworks about, um, I don't know, eight to 12 months in advance to reserve them. So uh, if there is a consideration of a ban, I just want to make sure people know that this July 3rd, we've already uh, paid a deposit on. Um, and like I said, that's $12,500 for a single show. So I just wanted to provide that information and make sure people know that we're looking into alternatives. Um, and our single show a year is very popular and maybe we can just do that. But um, we are keeping the concerns in mind. Thank you. Thanks, Katie. Um, Katie, do you have any um, knowledge or opinion on the financial impact if we were to not allow the fireworks to be held on uh, the evening of July 3rd? Um, in terms of the downtown and and how that would um, affect our crowds or in terms yeah. of our deposit? Yeah, no, exactly. Um, just as an ongoing thing, it seems to me that the fireworks are what keeps the crowds down on uh, <clears throat> on the State House lawn right up until the fireworks display. Yeah, um, our event annually, and we did some research on this and hired a company to um, try to investigate how many people come to our event. There are over 10,000 people annually who come to July 3rd. And you can imagine um, how that's an economic driver to the downtown. Um, that's the parade and fireworks show together. Uh, I strongly feel that there um, should be some sort of show uh, that could continue those crowds coming to gather on the state house lawn. Um, it may not be fireworks, but like I said, there's um, there's a cost to that. Thanks, Katie. <clears throat> um, Linda Berger. I just had a quick question. Is Montpelier Alive received some funding from the city, correct? Yes. I appreciate Katie's um, presentation about the thoughtfulness that's going into this by that group. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, folks. Um, one more hand. I sorry. Oh, you're just but using it. Oh, Audrey Femet. It's my. This might sound like a silly question, but is there any way to have fireworks um, with just the color and not the really loud sound? Because you know, being a former special educator, we had kids coming from Bosnia 
who, you know, experienced, you know, like the horrible, you know, bombing and loud sounds. And I, I think it was addressed the PTSD. These were the things that really affected people and it affects, you know, wildlife and pets are these hugely loud sounds. So it might be a silly question, but do we have just color and which people really like without the really loud sound? Just a question. <laughs> Apparently, there are some that are not as loud. Um, so I think that's going to be something that could be something that Montpelier Alive looks into. Okay. Yes, Pailin. So since Kate is here, then she will follow up, right? Well, you can talk I, to Kate. Yeah. Yeah, you're, as, as your yeah, member I'm of her board. To understand if I yeah. have to do anything afterwards, or since she's here and she heard everything and she responded, so that's her uh, responsibility to follow up. It's nobody's responsibility oh, to follow okay. up unless you know the council isn't telling anybody to do anything. Okay, okay, got it. Thank you. Just check. Okay. Hmm. okay, I want to make sure I'm not missing anyone who. Uh, has their hands up and I'm not seeing anyone. Thanks, thanks for coming. Okay, next up, homelessness report follow-up. Great, um, so in your packets, you received uh, staff recommendations um, from the Parker advisor presentation at the last meeting, um, <clears throat> excuse me. And so the next step is really to take a look at that and um, determine what you would like to do. So there are three areas that um, were made for recommendation within the report. They include the housing plan, the hub shelter, and the education outreach plan. Um, and so staff has provided individual uh, recommendations for each of those items in the memo. And so we can take them one by one, or we can um, have a general discussion, whatever your pleasure is. Um, but ultimately, I think what it boils down to, just in a quick summary, is determining what the city's role will be and um, how you would like to direct staff to proceed next. Why don't you give us kind of a high level summary of what is in the report? Sure. Uh, us, us and the members of the public. Yes, can, can do. Um, so from a high level, um, what's in the report is um, We'll be looking to uh, review the housing plan. Um, so the planning commission is currently working on the city plan um, and Parker advisors had re recommended that um, some of that plan include um, items related to the unhoused. Um, next up um, within those recommendations was related to a hub or a shelter and selecting a location maybe within the city that um, would uh, provide shelter, but also provide services um, as sort of a hub model um, with nonprofits um, and state entities providing services all in one spot. Um, and then the last item was outreach, um, making sure that people know where to go to get services um, and what's available to them. Not all. Okay, any questions from members of the council? Um, could we go through them one uh, through the uh, uh, response uh, item item by item? There are what five or six five or six line items. There, there's three um, generally. Yes. Yeah, and there are several uh, sub in in the response that yes. uh, Bill Frazier sent us. There are several subsets. We can we can do that. Okay, great. So the um, under the uh, under the housing plan, um, there are two uh, critical uh, recommendations uh, made by uh, by Parker Advisors. One um, one on the creation of more subsidized housing. And one, um, one on removing barriers to subsidized housing, so that uh, in the future, fewer people are are become housing vulnerable. And um, I just wonder if if we if we need to. Um, I want. I just wanted to make sure that those two elements, which I which I think are in fact 
critical are a uh, part of the housing plan that that is on ongoing, uh, as I understand it. Um, and I, I mean, it 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 became uh, more more important just in the last week or so because the I noticed that the um, the Isabel Circle project has completely changed. I mean, it was it was originally billed as a um, kind of a planned development with with you know that would fill fill the missing middle, so called, uh, with uh, cottages. I think fifty or fifty six, fifty four cottages. And now it really looks like a sort of standard subdivision. Uh, with 30 lots that are going to be sold to people who can afford to buy them and afford to build on them. And while we need that in Montpelier, we also need uh, housing that um, that is somehow subsidized and not just for the first buyer, but for um, subsequent buyers. And we we didn't have any control at Isabel, but we do at Country Club Road, which um, is not specifically under discussion here, but it's you know it's obviously in line for some decisions about housing. So it seems important that um, that we make that recommendation that subsidized housing be um, be considered as part of the plan, along with you know the variety and the types of housing and sizing and so on. Talking in the master plan style, or what is that? Plan I, I guess I think I, I think I am. I mean, I, I think that's what's what's being um, revisited is the 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 housing element of the of the city plan. Um, well, I think the entire master plan's in the works to that's be correct. Yeah. Done. And Kelly, do you know the timeline? I don't, but I can find out. I, I know. Uh, I, I just think I want to remind Tim the master plan has changed language to city plan. Okay. I just want to revert to master plan. I, too, yeah. but city plan is the master plan. Yeah. Just so you know. But that is the plan we're talking about yes. modifying. Okay. Yes. That is the plan we're talking about. It's in the it's in the development process within the uh, planning commission. Right. And it's been going on for a couple of years now. So I, I think they're planning on bringing it to the council this year sometime. Excuse me, Jack. Uh, not in Minta. Well, these are the same wonderful three points that they presented first time. I'm I'm still looking at people like Tim and others. Is where there's a property, I don't think we can assume another way taking on this burden, uh, or that that Sam, a good Samaritan, will have it the churches are having so much problem they're backing off i would really like us to find a property we can zoom in on i mean if we could find a, a property owner that will meet the city and become a partner with it i keep looking at that yellow house on main street the old funeral home and say oh it would just be that would be great um uh, how do we how do we make that happen uh, do we start knocking at all these Property owners, we go through the city's list. Uh, help me, Tim, as a realtor or anyone else. Uh, I'm really, I want to, to initiate a beginning with real property and put something in place. We can't wait for Elm, uh, the property, country club property. We need to do something now about this hub, mm. especially. If I might, um, yes. just uh, so the council should be getting the city plan in the summer or fall. Okay. And then there's a process of us holding public hearings before we adopt it. Uh, Carrie. Yeah, uh, the Housing Committee has seen um, some preliminary drafts of the housing portion of the city plan. Um, and so they've got a lot of work to do. But I feel that these concerns that Sal has brought up are being taken seriously in this planning process. Yeah. Uh, so one of my questions was about the, the public input process, and it sounds like there will be one um, at, at some point, maybe closer to the middle than the, than the end. But um, I haven't written off the, uh, the rec center myself, which was the recommendation of the, uh, of the Parker advisors. 
Um, I, I know we, in, in, uh, in Bill Frazier's response, he, he talks about um, undertaking another architectural study. I mean, we, we've done three architectural studies since 2016. We, as I understand, I don't know who's, who's looking at the building now, but I think somebody's reviewing the asbestos content not sure who, so that, that's really four, four reviews of the building. I think we know what's wrong with the building. Um, and, and the fact is we have to mitigate that building, whether we tear it down or leave it vacant or use it. So, you know, we're not, we're not throwing that money away if we mitigate it. And then we, the plan that the advisors, that park advisors, came off with didn't even require a complete mitigation. Um, so I, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm not ready to write off the rec center. I mean, I think, I think it's, a, uh, it's built like a tank. It has some problems that need to be solved, accessibility being one of them, mitigation of hazardous materials being another. Um, but we're also going to be, uh, there's a, there's the challenge of dual use over the next few years, but it's going to be a few years, probably three to five years before there's a new rec center, if there is. Right. Um, so I I think we have we have a good location. We just we just need to uh, take some action on it. Donna, so set aside four hundred twenty five thousand dollars. And that I could see, we've already spent some of that on consultant. I don't know if we're closer to three ninety nine at this point that we could spend on either the hub with services, or I'll bet you the main fifty five Berry Street is going to be a lot more than a half a million bucks. The mitigation of asphalt, uh, asbestos, yeah. as asbestos is just immensely enorm uh, expensive. So that's my bind is. Not that that building is not there, but now that we've discovered it's worse than we thought, uh, to put the money there and not do anything that's immediate that could be like the hub, then I, I get that's my priority. You know, I, I agree with Donna that and Sal. I think that the rec still needs to be on the table and considered for this, like it, for the consultants. And it's just something we've got to, it's, it's an asset we have. We need to look at it, study it, and, and know what we can do with mm -hmm. it. Um, and there, you know, I can come up with another handful of properties around town that we could also approach. Um, you know, and the four hundred thousand dollars doesn't find like these in our businesses. That's a good down payment, but yeah, it's not going to be enough to do the whole thing. Um, but I don't know that Montpelier has to be picking up the whole tab on this either. And that's part of the discussion is what's our role in this process. And I, it seems the state should be involved. This is a bigger issue than just Montpelier. Um, but we need to get going on these properties and looking at the options for this next year. Is the homeless task force, is that something they're doing or is that? Who's... I think we should set up a committee and you should be chair Another and really committee? go after Another the property. Yeah. <laughs> a short term committee. Or, really well, we've got the homeless task on... force. I mean, is that, it would seem like it must be right up there. Lauren, you had your yeah. hand up. Yeah. Just talk. I mean, mostly just echoing, I mean, my, my priority is that we are locking something in as a city that we're not like, I, I think we should have the rec center on the table. I think we should be looking for plan B's in case that like the timeline for the whatever construction needs to happen or whatever doesn't match up with this winter. But I don't want to be in the position where we're coming up with a partnership yet again, that then next year we have to renegotiate a new partnership. Like I want to be looking for a long-term solution or something that at least is like a medium term solution that's getting us to a long term solution that is not like because every year we have this conversation like oh no there's a crisis again that the churches and, and like part of going you know to some private landowners it concerns me a little that we're getting back into that of like finding a new partner that then we'll do it find it's hard and not want to do it again and so i just i really want the city to be committing to just finding something that's a, a multi-year at least kind of um prospect Ellen. I am sorry, you probably need to have that mic closer to you. Okay, I there will try again. Project my voice. So I am serving on homelessness task force as a city council representative. And Carol, uh, I think I'm right, right, Sal? 
the name. Yeah. So um, they have some alternative plans. So if uh, if you want to see them, we can share. She shared uh, like a two page ideas with us. Uh, we can share it with you and you because they already told told uh, told about this. What we can do with the rack um, building, and they have uh, some ideas using the funds just um, create some kind of short-term solutions because Tim was asking about the test work. That's why I just want to explain. So they have some ideas and we have to bring them uh, to the discussion. And will that be ready to make a presentation, say at our next meeting? I can ask them and I can share the uh, two-page document um, they sent to us with the rest of the city Great. council. Mm -hmm. I might just yeah. jump in really quickly here. Um, so uh, part of the, the the reason for the Parker Advisor Report was to kind of address some of these items. Um, and I think um, what would be really helpful is to get guidance on whether or not you would like city staff to fully vet those costs. So um, the items that might be identified by the Homelessness Task Force through Carolyn Ridpath may or may not be the full committee's um, position. It could be, um, but I think um, we would want to go from the Parker Advisor Report and then I'd sort of maybe take a look at the location itself um, and maybe sort of identify those items and see what the costs would be. Um, and we've done some of that work too um, as we've been preparing for this conversation. So we're really kind of looking for, do, do you want to look into this issue further and would you like us to come back to you with some of those real cost estimates so that then you know you can kind of take a look at that sit with it and then see where you are um with all due respect to the committee they've done a lot of work and carolyn has done an excellent job of bringing things forward and really kind of advocating for that but i also want to make sure that we are able to provide you with some details um so that then you've got um, and that's why part of the memo is uh, discussing a secondary or third party evaluation of some of the costs associated with this, because for this building, we've kind of had, you know, piecemeal studies done for different purposes. And we just want to be sure that we've got all the items, um, you know, in, in place and we want to do what you would like us to do. Yeah. Um, thanks, Kelly. That's why I, uh, we didn't share anything with you before. So we are just offering uh, because the task force name was mentioned a couple of times, but it is of course up to you know the staff and all the things you explain is uh, because they have been working such a long time. And if you had a chance to attend their meeting, you will see that so many alternatives were being discussed. And I think our job as a city council representative for that uh, committee, uh, just um, mention what they are offering for us. But I, yeah, I understand that's why uh, we didn't share anything before and with you. So, that is interesting. Nice question because the Parker study came from that committee, it was vetted through them, was it not? That's my understanding. The Parker Advisory Group worked with the committee. And I, I was just appointed. So I don't know what happened before me. So I've attended one meeting and uh, Sal and I will reach out uh, after that because we are both serving on committees. So I don't know what happened before me. So maybe they did, maybe they don't know. Maybe uh, more experienced city councils or city if staff I, can explain. I yeah. I'd be happy to. Um, yeah. So um, they did receive the report in advance of going to council. They did not ultimately endorse it, um, but they also did not vote to hold it in committee. Um, thank you for putting your request to us so clearly what you need from us. So uh, I would say that I would really like the city to pursue investigating how much it would cost to implement the recommendation of building a, a hub slash shelter um, at the rec center. And, and I think the rec center it, it makes sense. I know it's gonna come out to be way more expensive than anyone here probably thinks it's gonna be. And that's okay. You know, we wanna know, we need to know that. Um, 
but we need something to happen soon. We have people who need who have needs that need to be met immediately. Um, and this seems like a way to do it. And I think that, you know, we've also got um, possibilities for other recreational facilities that might take the place of that the current rec center, but I would encourage us to think about not waiting for that to be the case and to look really hard at what's happening in the current rec center building and think if there are ways for some of that those programs to happen elsewhere. I mean, for instance, we have three schools right in town that all have gyms that are not being used um, outside of school stuff. And I believe me, I know that's a fraught, complicated issue. And yet we have these beautiful facilities that are in our city. And so, um, and we have people who need a place to sleep at night and a need a place to shower and a need a place to put their stuff and get services. So I like to think we could work out any kind of, we could work that out somehow. Um, and then I also, uh, there's a question in here about what's the city's role in providing housing or helping or anything. And I, I just, I know that's a, that's a big ongoing question, but I, I just wanna kind of put a word in for the idea of it being appropriate for the city to assume kind of some kind of public responsibility for the, the safety of the people who are living here. And that there are, you know, we don't have a work farm, we don't have a poor farm, but um, we have prisons now. And that's pretty much what we do with people who are un, who can't find a place to live and can't hold down a job and don't have any family to take care of them. And, and I think it's worth including in the conversation um, our public and civic responsibility towards folks along those lines. Now, how we actually fulfill that, obviously is very difficult and complicated, but we need to keep talking about it. And, and, and this it's not part of the current report recommendations, but I also want us to think about longer term solutions for housing for people who maybe could be accommodated in housing. Um, I, I think we should talk about the idea of, is there a building up at Vermont College that's for sale that could be turned into housing for people who can't find housing somewhere else? And that the city may be able to have a role to play in that. And I know that all these things are out of our reach financially at the moment, but um, I think if we can, we're pretty good at finding money for things that we value. And so I think we should work on it. So I'm going to learn. Um, I, I agree with, with all of that, but I, I wanted to uh, emphasize a couple of things. One, uh, Kelly, I wanted to make sure that the, the cost of the mitigation was broken out according to the full mitigation of the building as well as the staged mitigation, just so we can have something to, you know, to compare. Yeah, I, we should definitely do that. And I think um, we would itemize items for this specific use and also probably use some of the feedback from the homelessness task force to, you know, provide those estimates so that we can also make sure that there are, you know, um, some, you know, sort of numbers to those things that they've already done a lot of the work. And so it's just maybe, you know, scaffolding that a little bit. Uh, I also, uh, agree that that uh, it it might make sense. Uh, I mean, I think I think it does make sense for the city to uh, take some responsibility for m managing uh, this issue. I think we we already provide some community services. Uh, this this is as you were saying, Lauren. This this seems to come up every year. Uh, I mean, it it probably needs a city department to keep just to keep the ball rolling. Um, we're right now, we're really in a situation that I consider to be an emergency. I was at the last homelessness, uh, the, the task force meeting and with, unless the legislature acts soon and the motels and hotels empty, um, our, the local population of unhoused peoples it could, could double or at least uh, close to that um, over the summer. And then we head into fall with, with what? I mean, it's April already. Um, so yeah, we can, you know, we can price things and we can survey things and we can look for alternatives. But I, I think we have something viable across the street, and the, we need to we need to act quickly because, um, really, it's like a hurricane. Um, Lauren. Yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah. I agree with um, the direction everyone's heading. I mean, I very much think, I mean, I agree with Tim. I, I think the federal government should be doing more. I think the state government should be doing more. I mean, one thought is um, I, I was 
a little underwhelmed, but I am interested in inviting the state back and maybe our our delegation to understand what is the state doing, what opportunities might there be for grant programs, for support, like what is their plan, which from the news, it seems like there is no plan, but I would want to hear that directly from them because maybe there's more going on behind the scenes than we're aware of and how would our services fit into, into that and maybe just us being an advocate, maybe there's some grant programs or something they can tell us about that we can be made aware of. I wish that were true. I know, <laughs> but get them on the record, at least saying that, no, we're dumping the responsibility onto every local community across the state to manage, which is atrocious and unconscionable, but here we are. And I think we do have a responsibility as a community to care for everyone who is living here. And so I think this path of uh, for me, directing city staff to look at what would the plan be for getting the rec center? I mean, I think if we get a red flag really soon that there's some huge problem we're not aware of, I mean, to me, it seems workable, but if it's like, it's going to be millions of dollars or something that we just don't have or something, I think keeping that track of plan B's um, or C's seems smart. The other piece that I think we should also be parallel, which you have in your memo is the staffing, because that then will become the next question. And so what's the city's recommendation for, do we hire someone? Do we, is there, you know, it sounds like there's open questions of if Good Sam or another way are interested or able to just take on um, extra work to staff this. So let's start answering those like as soon as possible also, so that doesn't become the next crisis. <laughs> well, as, as luck would have it, Rick DeAngelis has his hand up. <laughs> so Rick. Uh, does that mean you're inviting me to speak? Yes, it does. Uh, thank, thank you. And I'm so glad that you touched upon that. And I'm grateful for this discussion, but as it's proceeded, I'm thinking to myself, I hate to burst everybody's bubble, but uh, you're focusing on the easiest part, the real estate. And, uh, and I'm a guy that comes from a real estate background, but I've been operating shelters for the last three years. Now I know the most difficult part of trying to shelter people uh, is to operate. And, um, and you can believe that that challenge has increased greatly over the last two months. You know, we've had uh, two, we had somebody murdered last week in a shelter in Brattleboro. And we had uh, one of our staff, in fact, my own son, son who was, very savagely stabbed at the at a warming station. So Good Sam is very interested in being part of the solution here. And we expressed that to Kelly and Bill earlier today. But um, it's going to have to be done in a way that we feel is safe and in a facility that we feel is an appropriate facility. And quite frankly, I mean, we want to work with the city and everybody else, but it's got to be done on our terms if we're going to be the operator. Um, so, um, um, and I'll just leave you with one other thought. And uh, again, we shared these points with uh, Bill and uh, Kelly earlier today. We, we are not interested in running the housing hub. We frankly don't think it's all that the real critical part of this. We're not convinced that providers are gonna come. We're not convinced that the public is gonna come quite frankly. And uh, we do think the most critical part uh, is the shelter and a robust street outreach program in Montpelier and in the area. So I'll leave you with that. That That is really great to hear, uh, have your input on that, Rick. I appreciate that. Um, have given what's happened in a couple of cities now has is there a clear thought or are there ideas coalescing about what elements are necessary to uh, provide services in a safe way I'll, I'll i'll tell you we talk about that every day and um it's really challenging because on the one hand you, you want to um, treat people respectfully and decently and, and to trust them and welcome them. But on the other hand, there are some unpredictable behaviors that happen in the shelter. And so you're, there's always this tension, you know, uh, how strictly are we gonna control this environment? 
And if you get too strict, then it feels like you're running a prison or a jail or something like that. Uh, but on the other hand, maybe if you're too, um, uh, you know, op open-ended about it, you may be taking some risks. And quite frankly, I would say that I think the population that has been centered in Montpelier and on the streets present the most challenging behaviors that there are. So we're interested in serving that population. We have a whole network of services and shelters. And 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 this is the piece that we feel is that that um, really needs to be addressed well. And we want to do that, but we have to do it in a safe way. And we we can't overtax what we've already been what we're already providing right now. So that's a great question, Jack. But it, we're going to have to keep looking at that and and figuring out the best strategy that we can come up with. And Donna has a question for you, I think. I and Carrie hot, maybe too. Hot seat. Uh, when you talk about having a safe place, a way to operate the program in a safe place, fifty five Berry Street would be sharing it with general public of all ages. Right now, that rec building is used from all ages. Can, can you visualize using that space as a shelter for showers and bathrooms? At, se at separate times, I could. So let's say that we, we continued or our group continued to run it as an overflow shelter. It, it, you could only use it for 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 the homeless population during those times you you i i would not want to be mixing um the general public with with you know a high needs population of people i think that would be a mistake i you know there's some things i really like about that building and uh there's other things that i don't and um um you know i like the big open space uh, it gives you a chance to you know to watch people carefully and to have the action right in front of you but of course, that building needs so much that um, I'm concerned about that. And and one last point, and um, you know, I'm I'm concerned about the money too. I mean, if we're going to have a robust staffing thing, where's that money going to come from? I um, uh, I think even the you know the uh, uh, project at Christ Church over the winter that that uh, another way did. I think there. Uh, up around two hundred thousand dollars, and um, uh, in operating costs for that, and um, so this can get ex and uh, quite frankly, we're trying to we need to increase our wage rates because we're concerned that people aren't going to want to do this work, and we want to have a very robust sta staffing plan. So, um, so that's something that we have to throw into the equation here too. How can we figure out how to staff this appropriately and pay for that? And we're not thinking that the city has to be the entire part of that solution, but it may have to be part of it if it really wants to address it. Thank you. Thanks, Carrie. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate your, your kind of firsthand expertise um, perspective. And um, uh, I feel like it the voice that I'm hearing from you now is missing from the report that we received that we're responding to right now. Um, and so that raises all kinds of questions for me as to the role that our local providers played in creating that report and the role that the homelessness task force has played. So um, uh, I give so much credence and respect to your input and don't want to make decisions and, and make plans without having that. And I'm finding myself feeling a little um, uncertain about how we should proceed at this point, whether we should be turning to the Homelessness Task Force for advice about this. Um, I, I would have thought we would have heard that or be hearing that. Um, it sounds like they're working on that. We may hear something. But um, I, I think I... Uh, I guess I'm asking for your thought about, um, I'm hearing a lot about the, the challenges and, and what we can't do. And I'm wondering, <laughs> given that I think that 
the people in this room right now, the city council are feeling very positive and very enthusiastic about trying to move forward with doing some work on the part of the city and spending some money of the city's. What, uh, what's a, a, a way that we can do that fruitfully? And May I make one more comment and then I'm sure there are others that want to address that question. You know, I take some responsibility for that. I'm on the task force. I spoke with uh, Paul and Dan a couple of times. And, um, and and overall, I support the idea. But, you know, I, I, the thinking was, let's get some ideas out there. And then who's ever operating it is going to have to refine the plan. And that was the discussion I had with Paul and Dan. And um, and and also, since we had those discussions, the landscape has changed, quite frankly. We've had two brutal you know, events that have occurred. So uh, we are feeling a lot more cautious than we might have when I talked to those guys uh, earlier in the year. And um, um, so I don't think you, I don't, I think it would be a mistake to say, well, this isn't a good plan. List, you know, Rick DeAngelis just, you know, said all these things that are wrong with it. No, no, no. I think it's the right, it's, it's, uh, it's important to have this level of a response. And, um, but now we got to keep refi we got to refine it and look at the at the different options and see what really works. Thanks, Ray. Um, uh, Paige Curtin. Hi, um, I just want to say a couple of things about the rec center, um, which I really like the idea of using the rec center if we can. We've been doing dual use with the church for this entire winter. Um, and it seemed, as far as the church, I know there were some issues, and there will be with the population we're talking about. But, you know, I was in cleaning the room one morning a week for the entire winter, and it was, um, the guests were, for the most part, fine. Um, the place was not a mess. Um, it was easy to take care of. Um, we had, um, we had a really good um, staff person on call on and in there on Tuesday night, a guy named Sam, and I don't even know his last name, but he was really good with the population that was um, staying there. Anyway, dual use, I think, is possible. We might have to change the hours that the rec center is open a little bit, which I'm sure my grandson would be devastated about. But, you know, we could do that. And, and that leads to the next point, which is we've had kids playing basketball and adults playing pickleball in that building for years, asbestos and lead notwithstanding. So we could continue, we could use that building in a temporary mode. Um, uh, if we have a plan to remediate at some point, whether or not it actually happens or not, I don't know. But I don't see asbestos being a reason why we can't continue to use that building and possibly do it as a dual use because it's got a big space for sheltering more people. The other thing is there are bathrooms in there, which if they were updated, um, maybe one added on the ground floor, it would solve part of the public bathrooms problem. And you could easily put a simple lift to the back door of the gym and that would resolve at least to the first floor, the access problem which would resolve a couple of problems that are plaguing the building to begin with. And I think you could probably do all that for what's left of the allocated money. That's, that's my plug. Thanks, Paige. Carolyn, Ridpath. And I have to say Hi. that was Carolyn's idea. <laughs> <laughs> I want to urge the council to keep it simple. Uh, basically, what we need is an overnight, uh, an overflow shelter. So what we need is access. We need a bathroom. And we need whatever it takes to comply with uh, the city code on the subject. So to expand it further than that, uh, I don't think is relevant. And if we stick with the overflow shelter piece of it, then um, it's something that would be done hopefully every winter. So it's not creating any kind of a new um, activity. 
So again, I urge you to keep it simple. Stick with what, what's being proposed, that if you just dis do the bathrooms, you may not have to disturb any asbestos or very little, or it can be encapsulated. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, Peter Kelman. Uh, Peter Kelman, uh, uh, Mountain View. Um, I'm a member of the, uh, the Homelessness Task Force. I was the coordinator of volunteers for the, uh, the uh, Christchurch-based uh, shelter. Um, I was the coordinator for the Homelessness Days of Action that took place um, at three different uh, motels. I made about 20 pages of comments uh, on various drafts of the Parker Report. So I'd like, Jack, you to let me talk for a little more than two minutes. Um, and one of the reasons is that unlike, I think some people have a mistaken idea that because this, the, the, the Parker Associates were hired on the recommendation of the task force, that, the ta that, that they worked hand in glove with us. They did not. We received, despite the fact that in December, I gave them a backward planning uh, uh, schedule, which they ignored, we received approximately 10 days before you received, we received the first draft that we ever saw. I spent about 24 hours of time going through that um, and a couple of other people did too. There's another mistaken impression here, which is that the housing task, the homelessness task force is a monolith. The homelessness task force consists of 11 people, uh, six of whom are in the trenches working with people every day and frankly don't have the time to be reading reports or commenting on them. Five of, five of the appointees are regular citizens like myself, Carolyn, and Carolyn and a few others. We are the only ones who really have the time to get to read. I, 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 I promise you that most, most of the members of the task force didn't even read the report. And in the discussion, as Kelly said, there was not a vote to endorse it. She said there was also not a vote to withhold it. But I got to tell you, there were a lot of questions in it. And we identified a lot of things that were not in it that should have been in it. Um, uh, Carolyn's uh, proposal, uh, which I wish she would read to you, which is what uh, Pellin uh, 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 alluded to before, was developed by Carolyn. I helped her. Um, it is not a work of the task force. If you talk, want to go and talk, well, let's ask the task force. You're going to get approximately, well, you won't get 11 different answers, but you'll get a, probably about nine. So don't think that you're going to get the task force to answer any of your questions. What, all right. Now, let me just be clear about a few things. As a person who's been on top of this whole thing pretty much for the last 18 months, um, uh, um, actually, I was on the housing task force before. I was on the housing task force when the city plan planning process began four years ago. That city plan has been in the works for four years. And I'll tell you right now uh, uh, that it has not been, it did not come back to the housing committee until very recently. It was not shaped, the, the, it was not shaped in the, uh, uh, Parker Associates did not talk with the Housing Committee or the plan or the Planning Committee or the Planning Commission. Peter, this, can we get back? I'm going to I'm going to wrap it up. We're incredibly siloed here, and I'll tell you that I have read every draft of the Planning Commission's chapter on housing, and there is almost nothing in there about the issues that the, that the Parker report uh, brought up, almost nothing. There's one little thing about uh, affordable housing. There's nothing about, about um, subsidized housing. There's the whole discussion in there of, of, of uh, Country Club Road doesn't mention it, unless the city council directs the planning commission, the housing committee, and the homelessness task force to sit down together and work on this, that report, that chapter is not going to meet what the Parker uh, uh, report uh, proposed. It's just not going to do it. Thank, Thank you. you Peter. Uh, Linda Berger. Thank you. I'm from District 1. Um, I, I take it very seriously when Rick DeAngelo says that Montpelier has the most challenging population in the area. Um, I have to reference the 
a plan that's going to be talked about later to continue to support Confluence Park, where a city puts their money, reflects their values. We've got people that have mental health needs, other needs, shelter needs, and it's going to cost money to address those needs or the whole population of Montpelier will be at risk. And I've experienced this in San Diego. San Diego has a, a homelessness population issue. It also has a resource issue and it ends up being unsafe for both populations. Thank you. Thanks, Linda. So members of the council, are we in agreement that we want the city uh, staff to proceed with the cost estimate and the and the rest of what we were talking about. I don't feel we need to have a motion for that. I think we can just every, everyone agrees that this is what we and Donna. I, I would just like to add, uh, like the, what Rick was talking about, mixing uh, when we talked about doing other things with the rec center before, and when we put the lockers near them, right behind them, there was a lot of public push concern about mixing the age groups of different populations. I'd like some feedback from the rec center, how they feel about it. And perhaps we can even get more from, from Rick in detail. Thank you. Uh, Kelly, how long do you think it would will take to get those numbers? Well, following this meeting, we can go out um, to contractors to get them. Um, so it just would be, I don't know, maybe by the next meeting or maybe by meeting day. Okay. Well, I mean, there's a, I mean, it's an urgent, it's an urgent need. If you could, if you could put a, a time constraint on it, the, the, the sooner the better. If you can do that with the, with the people you work with, yeah. Helen, then Tim. Kelly, can we, uh, can we also, um, create some kind of timeline? Like, in I'm just making this up, right? In six months, we can do this, and the cost is like that. Not a, like a general cost estimate, because some things are very urgent, and we need some kind of time um, uh, frame, right? Sure. Then we can decide. Okay, in six months, this cost we can do this. In a year, it costs that much. We can do that. So I think it will give a better idea for us. Thank you, Tim. I think the um, if we look at the memo item six, it, which is titled "Should 55 Barry Street the Rec Center Building Be Considered," um, the second paragraph is effectively what Kerry said, um, and I think it details the instructions that we want to pass through um, to staff. So it looks like they were recommending it. it makes sense an architectural evaluation, and maybe an architect would be a good person or architectural firm to give us a timeline and give you know their experience of what's going on in construction. Do you agree, Seth? Or? Well, it just depends on how 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 far afield they go. I mean, I think this the structural evaluation of the building is has been done. We we might consider going back to somebody like Fred Loaf or, or somebody who's familiar mm -hmm. already looked at the structural stuff with the understanding that times have changed, costs have changed, but they you know they've already prepared cost numbers. So that okay. Yeah, and they might be able to do it um, to sweet, as it were. Yeah, keeping in mind that what we've looked at before was for a new rec center. It wasn't for yeah for this use. So. Okay, and that's what this specifically says. Identify those issues which must be addressed in order to provide a shelter. Donna. Well, well the part that worries me is the Wait architectural Sal, survey part. Sal. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yes. Just that we paid them to look at it before. I don't know how much we can expect. Ask by all means, but realize unless we're going to pay money for real, we might not get the detail you're thinking of. It's all, all going to be ballpark numbers and ballpark timelines. Do, would we have authorization to get some firmer numbers on this? What do you mean? Spend money. So, yeah. You want, you want, <laughs> and where would it come from? So we have to work with finance to determine where that would come from. Why, why don't you look into that and bring that to our next meeting? Okay. Uh, so, if I may, 
uh, sorry for the interruption earlier. Um, since there's a 90% chance, if not greater, that we'll have to mitigate that building eventually, why don't we actually ask for bids on the minimum work that Carolyn's plan would require as a first step from contractors who we, we can then, we can still, after we get the pricing, we can still decide not to do it, but we'll have firm pricing from contractors who are able and willing to do the work. And then we can, we can, uh, we can get estimates for the rest of the structure uh, over the over the over the following uh, weeks, or you know whatever that the initial time period we were thinking of would be, that would get us some firmer numbers more quickly for the portion that we that we're actually talking about completing in the near future. It would, but it seems like we're getting ahead of ourselves to do yeah. that. Yeah, let's do some due diligence here. Get back to you with sort of what the options might be for fulfilling what's been recommended for the memo, and also kind of dovetailing some of the more immediate needs. Uh, seeing, you know, how much that might cost, if 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 anything. I mean, maybe we're in kind of a bid situation where we might be able to get some some information up front. We'll see. Okay. Sounds good. Ready to move along to. Chapter two in the Kelly show. Yeah. Strategic plan item 12. And the purpose of putting this on the agenda was to um, have a review of what we've adopted for our strategic plan um, to get a sense of how people will feel about it now and whether we want to have a deeper look at the whole thing now as opposed to uh, in the future. The, Kelly? Yes. Um, so I am going to give you a quick presentation. Um, so I'm going to just step down there. Um, and if you'd like, I can turn down the lights on this side of things and then we'll take it from there. Great. Okay, cool. Big question. How long is your presentation? It's five after eight. Will we be done by 8.30? Uh, I hope so. <laughs> your, your presentation will be done by 8.30 at least. Yes, I'm not sure about the discussion. All yeah. depends. Okay. Hey, can everybody see this presentation here? Perfect. Okay. Um, so as um, Jack provided in summary, the, the purpose of, of this presentation is to bring everybody up to speed on our strategic plan. Um, and also just to make sure that what we've got in our plan is reflective of council goals and priorities. Um, there are three options um, that you, you might take uh, for tonight uh, following this presentation. One is to affirm the current plan. Two is to maybe affirm the plan, but with minor amendments. Or three, um, to go back and review the plan um, in advance of the next strategic planning process, which would likely require an additional meeting, um, but we can certainly do that if that's uh, your pleasure. So I'm going to go through the presentation here, um, and then we'll take the discussion from there. Um, so let's see here. Okay. I'm a little ahead of myself here. Okay. Perfect. Um, so what we're going to talk about, um, is what the strategic plan is, why the strategic plan, talk about the cycle a little bit, and then the, you know, the three really high levels of the strategic plan and why they're important, the vision, the goals, the strategies and initiatives. Um, just starting with the, the what is the strategic plan. It's the process in which the council defines the city's vision for the future and identifies the goals and objectives. Um, and then the why is it allows for the city to provide prioritize new projects and um, to make sure that they're serving the council's vision um, and to measure progress and outputs and to provide clarity and transparency for the work that the city does. Um, and so as you can see here from um, this graphic, this really kind of shows um, from top to bottom um, what the strategic plan is visually um, from vision to action. And I can go through each of the items individually, but you get the gist. 
And so this um, quadrant map just kind of shows you, you know, how we might sort of assess and address um, the strategic plan and how we sort of determine what might uh, rise to a level of priority um, and how we are going to use our time. I know um, Bill has mentioned to you in the orientation that, you know, we only really have a hundred hours together, so we want to really make it count. And so um, the strategic plan is, um, you know, that document. Um, I also should mention that we recently, within this past cycle or so, have aligned the strategic plan with a budget process so that then um, we can make sure that we're, we're putting money to those priorities. And so this uh, shows you the cycle of the strategic plan um, and the elements of strategic planning. Um, and so we go through each of these individual spheres um, to kind of take a look at things as we're um, working through the strategic plan. Um, when we start the strategic planning process in the fall, we'll go through all of this. Maybe me leading the process and maybe a facilitator. It depends, but um, we'll go through all of these items. Um, and so just so you get um, kind of a, a view of what this looks like and so that we could apply it to a, a real example, um, we've got this um, emergency management example here, but you've got your, your goals, which are public health and safety. You've got the strategies, which is emergency management, and then you've got the initiatives, which breaks down into the hazard mitigation plan, the um, continuity of operation plans, um, and then maybe some table talk exercises. And then from there, you've got very specific actionable items. And so each of our um, goals um, mirrors that and the way that we've got it broken down further in the presentation. Um, and so I mentioned this at the beginning, the goal of, of this review is really to determine whether or not the current plan is in alignment with the current council. Um, and then these quotes are just, you know, sort of, um, you know, some, you know, thoughts around, well, you know, why we're doing this, um, you know, really kind of looking at um, making sure that, you know, we're getting the work of the city done that, that you want done. And so this is a little bit of an ugly slide, but um, I think it makes the point. We're doing a lot of work, and this is the vision um, that came forward as part of the prior process, um, but you can kind of see what's been important in the past. Um, and what is really shaping um, our, our goals as we move forward. So these are our goals. Um, so these are the things that will break out uh, in the next slides, um, but improving com community prosperity, providing responsible and engaged government, creating more housing, practicing good environmental stewardship, building and maintaining a sustainable environment, and then improving public health and safety. You also note that this looks um, kind of like a dashboard because it is. Um, it, it's part of our Invisio platform that we use um, and is also part of the reporting materials that was included in the packet. So in summary, um, these are sort of the higher level goals and their prioritized strategies for how to address them. And so they're, they're pretty high level. Um, but they provide sort of the goal and a little bit of a definition around what we're going to do. Um, and so I can go through each of these individually, but I'll move on to each goal. Um, and so moving on to that, each of them is, is broken out here. Um, so we've got improved community prosperity, and then you can see you know, what the goal is and then what each of the individual strategies are and what the initiatives are underneath those um, strategies. And so we can go through them one by one if you'd like, um, but the materials that were provided do provide an assessment of these items and where they are. Um, of note, just to, if you're looking for like a quick like Cliff Notes guide, the, the disruptions um, report is really helpful, I think, in determining the um, key initiatives that may have stalled out. Um, and some of them actually, I was looking back through them and we do owe you another report on that. Um, and I think that you'll see that some of them have actually Picked forward um, in the next iteration. I'll keep moving on unless if you want to take them one by one or just I'll keep going. Maybe go through them at the goal level or at the strategy level. Okay, I can do that. Does that sound good to people? This is new, new to some of them. Sure. So I'm just going to um, maybe pause here and just take a look at um, this one community prosperity and then take a look at the strategies. And just make sure that they kind of make sense. And if they don't, um, maybe we can have a conversation about that. I can't see. I can see. 
strategy 1.3 on okay. my computer, but I don't see it up there. Oh. Maybe it's something about the projector. It is. It's getting cut off on the bottom. Um, uh, with people in the room, we've got we've got city staff in the room, so they they have the report. Um, and then, so I think as long as people online are good with it, is that okay? I think everyone online can see it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I'll just go through the strategies real quick and just see if they make sense. Um, so for this one, um, improve the community prosperity. Um, the first strategy is to actively support economic development and promote outdoor economic development. And so you've got the initiatives under that um, where we're prioritizing recreation and parks as an economic driver, and then um, prioritizing revitalization and proceeding with Confluence Park. Now, <laughs> if this is number one, like it's our priority. Well, the, so the strategy is sort of something that did, you know, come to the top of the discussions um, for some of these these items. Um, and so I, I think looking at it in terms of actively support economic development and the promotion of outdoor economic development. So it's kind of a twofold. And then you've got the initiatives underneath it that are supporting that. So let's see. I mean, when we developed this, though, it wasn't like this was the number one priority. Like, I would view them all as like kind of, or the way I took it at least was like it was like six equal. Like, infrastructure is just as important or more important than improving community prosperity. Like, they they were all standalone essentially. So I would not say like just because they happen to be in this order, we could have reversed the order of any of them. So I don't, I don't, I wouldn't read too much into like the order that stuff is in versus just do the strategy still make sense. So, so should we save our comments on the individual ones yeah, we'll for a discussion to, later? Yeah, we can get through the whole thing. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Um, so, uh, the next one, the strategy is to actively support the expansion of city-provided childcare options. Um, so, I'm, I'm just going to focus on the strategies for right now, and not get into the initiative pieces. Um, and then the the third here listed is to implement new economic development plans and supports. Um, so those were the items that we identified to improve community prosperity. Um, moving on to the next one, um, to provide responsible and engaged government. Um, so we said we would, um, in terms of strategies, communicate effectively. Hold on here. Okay. Um, so we Increase accessibility, focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and then increase city staff and council capacity. The next one to create more housing, um, we wanted to increase available housing units, um, meet emergency housing needs, and study the underlying housing barriers. And then under practice good environmental stewardship, uh, we want to take a look at the promotion um, to promote conservation of river and water land resources, address climate change issues, and expand parkland. And then under build and maintain sustainable infrastructure, um, we wanted to address newer improved infrastructure needs, invest in and implement long-term Department of Public Work infrastructure plans, Continue infrastructure funding strategies. And then this one's a little bit small, so sorry about that. Um, improving public health and safety. We wanted to address homelessness in the community, provide policing, which fits Montpelier's needs and effective mental health, be disaster ready, and uh, focus on public safety planning. Um, and so this, this this slide here gets beyond the goals. And the, this is, um, so I'll, Maybe keep going with the rest of the presentation and then come back. Um, this is uh, the results of the national uh, citizen survey that we did this past fall, which can kind of show you which items um, we scored lower than the benchmark on, which ones we scored higher. So lower being not as great, higher being good. Um, and the items that are bolded are addressed within our strategic plan. Um, so those are items that we're, we're working on. Um, and so I mean, you can see that in the higher benchmark areas, you know, we're, they're definitely representative of the work that the city council is doing, and it's pretty impressive, you know, but then on the lower side of things, there are some 
things of concern that, that we're working on, um, but also should be noted um, as we get into future cycles or within this one. So the next steps, um, so this is pretty, pretty straightforward based on what we've been uh, talking about. Um, we need to determine whether to keep or amend the current plan, um, and then you know perhaps identify areas of future interest, and then just open it up to questions and discussions. And I can stop the share here, um, or I can put the slides back up in terms of just the individual items, or we can it's up to you what you'd like to do from here. Go ahead. I suggest that we agree. Okay, council members. We have had the presentation on our strategic plan. So what would you like to do now? Do you feel do we feel that we're close enough to where we want to be that we can do some tweaking tonight and be done with it? Or do we feel that we want to have a a much bigger and more in-depth discussion? Carrie. All right, I'm I'm going to strongly advocate for not having a big in-depth discussion. Um, I I like strategic plans. I think this is a good one. I I love the reporting that the staff does for us. It's very thorough. It's very helpful for me to be able to see where things are, and then and the disruptions report particularly is great to know why something didn't happen or why it's been slowed down. Um, I think to, part of the point of having a strategic plan is so that we have a period of time set out where we have planned and we know what's going to happen. And so I'm not in favor of making any big, I'm not really in favor of making any amendments to it midstream, um, especially since in within a few months we have coming up presumably our next strategic planning process. Uh, so, I, but I recognize that if this is a two year plan that we have a lot of different people on the council. I wasn't part of creating this plan. Um, most of us weren't part of creating this plan. And so there are probably thoughts and opinions. I definitely have thoughts and opinions about things that if I could change it, I would, but I don't wanna do it right now. And I'd rather we didn't. So I'm advocating for us not doing it right now. Maybe if there's some really big things that people wanna flag right now that we can note so that when we get to this in a few months, we know these are the things that we're really on our mind, but if we change it as we go along every few months, then it's it loses a lot of its value as a strategic plan. So I'm not in favor of that. Okay. Donna, you're just not, you're just agreeing. Lauren. Yeah, I mean, I was part of this plan, so it it aligns with my priorities still. Um, I I do like Carrie's idea of I would at least really appreciate knowing what, especially the new counselors, if there's big things that are not here that you're going to be putting forward. Um, if like if we follow um, Carrie's recommendation of process, um, I just think it would be really valuable to understand like what the scope of the year might look like and what kind of like changes might be proposed um, so that we can start wrapping our heads around the, the new counselors' priorities. Mm -hmm. Tim. Seems like, I mean, obviously the the goal slide is terrific, um, and the next slide down with summary of goals and prioritized strategies uh, all works for me. It seems like it's when we go to that next level of breakout, and this is a really long, precise, broken out, layered plan. It, it, there's pieces of there that it really falls apart for me, but but I agree with Carrie. I, I think we've got to keep our priorities, and if we really want to accomplish the goals of what the voters voted us to do um, just a month or so ago. It, we've got to focus on infrastructure and helping the, the homeless problem and working on these key problems that are in front of us and we are working on that. So I don't think we want to be distracted from that work. Um, so I agree. Well, for instance, I noticed you had a reaction when you saw proceed with Confluence Park. Oh and I, I know that that's one of our initiatives, but we've also already taken action to say, well, we're not putting any more city money into it. We are letting the proponents of this park go out and try to do some fundraising. Okay. But we're not we're not actually doing doing it at this point. So it's it's on our list, but it's not something we're really doing. 
it just needs to be way further down the list than it appears here for me. Uh huh. Yeah, it's. But we have money in the pipeline, so we have to make a decision about that money, which we put off for eighteen months. Yep. Mm -hmm. It's also. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else have any? I um, I pretty much concur with what with what Jim says. I'm I'm great with the with the big picture stuff. I think some of the smaller, particularly in the in the uh, improve community prosperity uh, subsections. But um, I agree. I, I think I think we're we're addressing the things we need we need to address. We're spending our time where it should be. Um, the issues that I'm most interested in are all in here, so I'm I'm okay. Okay. Anybody else have any thoughts? And you don't have to jump up and say anything. Let me just check. Uh, we've got a couple of people uh, online. Uh, Paige Girton. Hi. Thank you. Um, I guess economic prosperity is kind of a worn out phrase and I feel like it really isn't terribly meaningful. I would love to see the council consider changing that to something along the lines of economic equity. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Uh, Linda Berger. Thank you. Um, I would just like the council to consider that in strategy 4.1, um, practice good environmental stewardship, Conservation of air quality resources isn't included in that. And uh, I think that I'd hope the council would consider air quality. That was definitely not on our uh, radar when we were talking about it last time. And so I, I'm sure that that will be something we talk about uh, next time. Um, Okay, I, I think we're set. Thank you. Thanks, Kelly. Next up, we have the Code of Conduct. And this is something as, as I think, uh, think you all know, this is something that typically we just adopt without uh, without change or a lot of discussion at the uh, at the initial uh, organizational meeting after town meeting and um, we passed over it last time because there was probably going to be some more discussion um, what is your pleasure with this you notice that there's a proposal from me to uh, to change the time limit um, for gen general business and appearances. And I don't know if there's uh, enough support. I'm certainly not going to push it if uh, my fellow members of the council do not uh, do not support it. But I'll just point out that on occasion, there are people, there are specific uh, comments that people have to make that two minutes isn't enough. And I know we ordinarily let people go to three or so. Um, but the other part of the uh, proposal that I have in mind is to manage the overall time of general businesses and appearances to ensure that it never is going to go beyond 30 minutes. And I think that that's another important part of it. And I would be happy to do what people want on this topic. Donna. I have a couple of comments. And my understanding is we don't go at two minutes. We put the one minute up at three minutes, people are cut off at four. Oh, okay. So that's, that's been, know. and so I would love to have 
an actual automatic timer that we have offer a table here and people come up, they have a place to put their papers, they push the starting button and they can see the time. And we really, if we say to, we mean to. But because I'm keeping time, the previous mayor and I tried to explain to you, I get involved in the discussion. I can't guarantee I'm going to hit it at two. So I, I feel more comfortable knowing I'm giving everybody three from when I do pick it up so that everybody's always getting more than two minutes. But then, so I put the one minute up at three, inevitably they go to, some of them go to the red. At that point, they're at four plus. And by the time they actually leave, most are at five. And 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 it sounds like you'd like to be relieved of that say, burden. Let's do it. So uh -huh. if it is going to be two, let's be two. But it's going to be like, they do make buttons, you know, automated things that you can sit there and the person, but then it's going to be a little beep. And when I tried to get the council before to allow me to have a beep, they didn't like it. So that's why we went to the, this. But if you had something that was automated, digital, they would see it and it would beep. And that's it. You're done. And do but, they make it two-sided where they can see it and we can see it too? It, you have to you have to go Google it and find uh -huh. out what kind of contraption you can make. But so that's one thing. I really would like it to be independent of the person and off of me or anyone else. And that to realize that if we do things at general appearances, there are councils such as our Montpelier Roxbury School Board, they only allow public comment at general public comments. They do not let the public comment on each individual item the way we do. Burlington City Council does the same thing. You only make public comments during the public comment. You do not make a comment unless it's a specific public hearing, which is a different type. And I do emphasize that our meetings are for us. It's the only time that more than three of us can talk. We can't even talk in the hallway. If there's more than about anything we just talked about, if it's more than three of us, and I don't think people understand how confining that is. So the only time we hear one another is here. And we're giving so much time to the public throughout the meeting. I don't mind expanding this, but then I really want constraint elsewhere, unless it's a public hearing. So that's my two cents. Palin, I think I saw your hand. Wow. Don't know how to use this. So uh, I just want to support uh, her idea about taking it from an individual and having the clock. Uh, most of the computers have their timer. So we don't have to buy or anything. If we arrange our computer and just uh, put it on the screen, it will do it by itself. So that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah. Uh, uh, the fact that you're already going to four minutes and then most people take five argues for making the limit five. But the ones I, I have to use to sign for, there are plenty of people who talk mm -hmm. under two minutes. Yeah. But mm -hmm. the ones who I end up having well, to cover. Well, I think we can encourage to and put, put the limit at five. I, I wonder about the comments during the agenda, actual agenda items themselves. I mean, you're, you're, you're uh, arguing. Um, for, for no public comments after the- Or not five minutes. Again, if you look at our- A shorter period during that time. I, I just think it would be odd to be discussing something. I mean, when someone comes to the meeting, they don't know what we're, our reaction to an issue is going to be until they hear it. They might have something they want to say before they hear us talk, but they may also have a response that I think it's worth our allowing them to make and uh, that might benefit us if we hear it. Even though I agree, we have so little time to spend discussing it as a group. Terry, uh, I think that the structure that we have now is is pretty good. And sometimes it it can go on for a very long time. When the fact that we allow public comment on every agenda item, but I think on the on the whole, I thought about this a lot, kind of weighing uh, different ways to do it. I think on the whole, the fact that we err on the side of allowing more public comment opportunity is good. So. I want to stick with that. Um, and I think we do a pretty good job. I, I think we have a, a very good uh, kind of process set out that can keep control of it so that we're not getting into like back and forth and, and discussion because it's not a public discussion time. It's a, it, you know, it's our, it, it's, it, this is our meeting with public input. Um, so I didn't realize that we were, that, that we were extending our time quite that much. I knew it was, I knew we were, stretching the two minutes. Um, 
five minutes feels like a really long time to me. I, I think if we make it five minutes, a lot of people will take five minutes who might otherwise be trying to rein themselves in. I do like the idea of limiting it all to 30 minutes. I think that's a great idea. It, it does require the mayor, whoever's facilitating the meeting to get to know at the beginning how many people there are who want to speak and to do a little bit of math. And then we have to really keep very tight control over the time. So that could be logistically challenging, but I think it'd be worth a try. Um, wonder if we said three minutes and it was a real three minutes with a timer and of some kind. And then the mayor always has the uh, discretion to allow somebody to talk longer if they need to. Does that work for people? All right. So <laughs> uh, um, let's let's see. We I see one person with a hand up. Uh, Peter Kelman. Um, I'd like. Uh, uh, the council to consider, if not this time, next time around, uh, something which many uh, councils do around the country, which is a council conduct with the public in public meetings. It includes things like be welcoming to speakers and treat them with care and gentleness, be fair and equitable in allocating uh, hearing to, uh, public hearing time to individual speakers, give the appearance of active listening, ask for clarification, but avoid debate and argument with the public, no personal attacks of any kind. Th these are ideas that govern the way uh, the, the council treats people who come before them. And just to just, to, just to talk about one little, one, one of them. This, um, and you can find these on the web. There's a lot of things uh, l like this. Speaking in front of council can be a diff, this is, a, I'm just reading, can be a difficult experience for some people. Some issues the council undertakes may affect people's daily lives and homes. Some decisions are emotional. The way the council treats people during public hearings can do a lot to make them relax or to push their emotions to a higher level of intensity. I can tell you, I've talked to a lot of people who go before the council and they feel intimidated and they feel they're not being heard. They feel that, that people are looking down at their, uh, whether this is fair or not, they feel people looking down at their phones. And th the fact that there isn't any interaction is problematic because, of course, you guys are not really supposed to interact. But there needs to be a way to be a little warmer about it. Um, so I, I just hope you'll think about if you're going to allow people to speak uh, to make them feel more comfortable about speaking. But, and by the way, let me just say this one last little thing, which is that hearings are too late for many people. By the time there's a hearing, people just don't believe that anything's gonna change uh, because of a hearing. They really do wanna be able to make input well before the hearing. I think you should think about that, Donna. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. So by um, unanimous consent, uh, are we okay with changing the... Uh, those two provisions of the uh, of the rules of conduct, the time limit, and the total time for uh, for general business and appearances. I have a, another change I would like to suggest, but we could do them separately if that's a better way to handle it. Not to that section, but to a different okay. section. We're good on that. Okay, great. And we'll have to figure out some technology, some some device. Okay, Terry. So I would like to, it's a B7. So it's under general rules and appropriate attire. And now of course I can't find it in here, but um, yeah. Okay, appropriate attire including wearing shoes, pants, and shirts are required in the council chambers and other meeting rooms at all times. I don't think this is necessary. I think we could strike it. Um, I think it, uh, it sends a message of, we do things in a certain way here and it, we have to be very proper. And if you're gonna come and, and be with us, you have to play by our rules and you have to do things the right way and you have to you know, behave yourself. And I don't think that's a message that we wanna send or need to send. 
Um, I think this is in general, we try to be pretty welcoming. I think there are lots of things we could do to be more welcoming, but this just, this feels um, unnecessary to me. So I would propose that we get rid of it entirely. Any objection to that? All right. I think we're good on that too. Let's put it back in. It's it's the, the whole time I've been at on the council or coming to meetings, never seen anyone address dressed in a way that would run afoul of this. Maybe no shoes, but right. Yes, Donna. That one, if I could add the use of seats, it talks about persons in the audience shall use the audience seats unless invited by the mayor or staff to sit at the presentation table or council seat. Now, sitting here, I deal with somebody who roams around and sits on that table, and it's very distracting. And I know part of it is my own dyslexic that I, I, do, I really find that hard. Uh, is there any way to, if any, maybe people object to this, but is there any way to? Make suggestions to have people sit in their seats. I hearing hearing that now. I will. Uh, it, it's already a rule. I'm I'm happy to say to direct people to follow it. Thank you. I think I think that's uh, that's a good point. It, it doesn't bother you what he's doing, but it, doesn't it? <laughs> okay, good. Thank you. I oh appreciate yeah, that. we we've had people come up to stand behind the city employees at the table and stuff like that, and. Yeah. Uh, and I think you're right. I, that's a that's a good point. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Anything else? Are we ready to move on? Okay. Next up is another one of those things that uh, we take up every year, and that is the R group norms. And um, it's it's in the packet. And are people prepared to just uh, adopt them, readopt them the way they are, or have any further discussion about them? And you know, we we adopted these several years ago, and and I took the time last night again to to read through this whole list again, and, it, and it's really a set of behavioral expectations that we have assumed on ourselves to have constructive uh, engagement with each other. Um, and so I think there's some, some real value to saying, yes, we adopt this. We, we think that uh, we should hold ourselves to these standards. And I know there have been times where people have reminded each other or all of us of, uh, of the value of following these norms. Donna. I love that there's a council member or staff who are good wordsmiths to reduce the, the line items, but this came out of a rather dysfunctional council that went into retreat. It took a lot of time, and hence it's more lengthy, I think, than it needs to be. So anyway, so I'm looking for a good wordsmither to make suggestions, but I feel the essence of it is really great. Yeah, anybody want to volunteer to take that on? Okay. I, okay. Okay, so we'll, will we have it by next meeting? Sure. Good, because let's, by next meeting, we either have a, a condensed version or we just adopt this one again. Um, anyone in the public have anything to comment on this? I don't see any hands up. Okay, we're up to other business. Don't have any other business. City Council reports start at this end tonight. Lauren. Uh, nothing to report tonight. Thanks. Same. Nothing to report. Thank you. Right. Well, I did attend first committee meetings uh, since we started off, and the housing committee was interesting, and also the stormwater implementation committee. So, 
as my learning curve expands, both of those were really good to be part of. Great. So, uh, likewise, I I attended my first couple of uh, many meetings. I'm hoping Donna, if you have anything to say about transportation infrastructure, that you will handle that. It was sort of new to me. Uh, homelessness was the other one, and I think I've talked a little bit already about what went on with that meeting. I mean, the the, the real focus now is is handling the uh, the ex the exit from uh, from the hotel program. So. Um, I think the the committee's working pretty hard. The task force working pretty hard uh, to figure out uh, how to get something ready uh, for that. So, Terry, uh, along the same lines, I attended the my first meeting of the Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee, and um, the I the I think the relevant thing to report now is that they are actively recruiting new members. And um, so if anyone is interested in serving on that committee, they could reach out to any of the committee members, including myself, and I'd be happy to talk with them about it and encourage Great. folks to apply. Thanks. Um, uh, the storm water didn't need, as Tim mentioned, and just give everyone a heads up, not to anyone's surprise, we found within our city, we have silos and we have different systems for water, sewer, and we're going to add storm water. So we have Right now, two different people entering information sort of in two different systems that don't speak to one another. And Stormwater thought, oh, we can just blend into this system. Well, there's all these problems. But the good thing is, because we want the stormwater, the sewer, and the water bills to all be integrated and related to one another in one mailing, that we're going to come out of this ahead. But we're going to have to spend some money. <laughs> and we're certainly going to have to dedicate staff time to it. We don't have to go to all new software, but we do have to do major modification. So it's a typical story, right? You start here and new things happen and you get a little, you stray a little bit. Uh, so that's the good news. You'll be seeing some pricing uh, coming up, some rate uh, will be presented to the council. I believe they're gonna be in May. And likewise on the infrastructure committee, uh, we are going to do what we planned to do last summer, but because we ran into the problems with the railroad and getting our painter to do the striping, we were going to do a temporary lane, the shared lane on Barry Street. It's part of that study of Main and Barry scoping. So when you come into the Main Street intersection, you may have noticed there's now two crosswalks. It goes from one side of Main Street by the, the parklet um, and the Shaw's that little intersection, there's actually two crosswalks and they both have flashing lights. They were painted, but they're faded out, but those also are gonna be repainted. And then when you get on the Barry side, there's gonna be a shared path with bicyclists and walkers sharing the same space that then connects it to the rec building, to the U shared path that goes way out to Bar Hill and by the dam. So that's gonna happen. We did all this prep work last year and then it wasn't able to be put up, but there'll be new painting, new signs. We we'll hope that people will really, uh, pedestrians and bicyclists will share the space and enjoy it this summer. In 2024, it'll actually be constructed permanently, so. Um, thanks, Donna. One of, those, one of the things that I remember discussing when I was on the Trans Transportation Infrastructure Committee was, um, and so this is a few years ago now, but we talked with uh, <clears throat> with Tom about the idea of getting like a temporary temporary hardware to for a roundabout at the Main Street and School Street intersection to see to as a trial run for uh, for that. Uh, con converting that intersection to a roundabout and and that never happened and is that has that come back into discussion at MTIC? Well it's part of the one of the main one of the intersections that's in the main Barry Street scoping is also other intersections in Maine and that's there but the resources dealing with the pandemic and where DPW has been we've also been in partnership with local motion from Burlington and so their schedule impacts it. They're helping us with the, this temporary that we're going to be doing this summer. So right now that's on the back burner, but we are hoping to do that because that is in the plan to turn that school and Maine into a roundabout. 
great. And you, you may, you and I may have talked about this, but I've also for years been thinking that Bailey would be a good place for uh, round of Valley. There, it's 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 plenty wide enough, and uh, yeah, and so I'd love to times, see that. It really doesn't need cars sitting there idly. Yeah. Yep, great. Mayor's report. I am. I have nothing to report. Uh, so I'll pass it to the clerk. City manager, acting city manager. Thank you. Um, just a few things. Um, so I wanted to just provide a, a, a just quick um, plug for the next um, item for Country Club Road. Uh, the next meeting will be May 24th when they'll be coming to council to really talk about the uh, results of their spring engagement. Um, I also wanted to mention that um, the spring engagement phase dates will be coming out um, where we'll be meeting with the public again. Um, the first date is April 29th. The second date is May 3rd, and the third date is May 8th. The structure will be very similar to what um, the winter engagement was. One will be at Country Club Road, one will be um, here in Chambers, um, and then one will just be on Zoom. Um, so those dates will be coming out. and. Um, there's a, a nice graphic on the flyer um, that Evelyn has put together that uh, really demonstrates sort of what has been happening with that process. Uh, fall 2020 vision, winter 23 direction, spring 23 is sort of this first phase completion, and then we'll get sort of a master plan for a decision in June. So just kind of laying that out there for you um, so you know that those things are coming up. Um, and then the other thing that I wanted to kind of put before you is uh, something to consider um, in light of just all of the decisions that will need to be made around Country Club Road, if perhaps you might consider having a member sit um, in with staff on the internal process, um, if that's something you'd like to consider doing so that then, you know, you've got sort of a direct feed on the information being provided. Um, so just something to consider. Um, and then uh, the next thing um, is kind of a thing that I don't get to do very often since I'm not usually sitting here. So I'm thankful to be doing it is this is the second um, full week in April, which is the National Public Safety Telecommunications Week. Um, so I just wanted to send thanks out to dispatch for all that they do and keeping us safe. So that's what I have um, for my items. Thanks. One I just remembered um, and Chief Nordenson, I just wanted to uh, say thank you. I just was really grateful to see ongoing efforts at transparency updates to the uh, police department website. And really this was, we did a lot of work um, as a council and uh, creating a public committee, a police review committee, a lot of recommendations and a lot of um, a call for just greater transparency and accessibility. Um, and. And so just really grateful to see that that work is continuing uh, even without that committee even existing anymore. Uh, so just uh, thank you for that. Okay. Without objection, we are adjourned at 9.02 PM.